I'm Jen from the Frugal Friends Podcast, and when I'm not cutting the end of the toothpaste tube off to get that last little bit of toothpaste, I'm stacking Benjamins. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and my wonderful calendar says it's National Dentist Day. Who on earth gave them a day? Maybe next is National roto Rooter Man Day. Well, the dentist may tell you this won't hurt, which always is a lie. So we thought, what are the biggest lies in finance? We share a whopper with the man from the Successfully Unemployed podcast, Dustin Heiner. And... Joining in the fun from the Afford Anything podcast, it's the all-knowing Paula Pant. And from this podcast, say hello to OG. But wait, there's more. Today in our Friday FinTech segment, Joe will talk with the inventor of the retirement budget calculator, Jason Parker. Ha! I wonder how much money of my dentist retirement I contribute to every time I go. Bet he's using Jason's calculator to cha-ching on that all the way to the bank. And as always, we will magnify someone's money. And of course, we'll discuss my amazing trivia. And now the guy with the perfectly white smile, it's Joe Salcia. I can't believe Doug is actually dishing out compliments today. What the heck is that about? Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Doug's Turning Over New Leaf podcast. I'm Joe Saul. See, hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter and across the card table to help start your weekend. It's my good friend, OG. I feel like Doug's setting us up for a little bit of a uh, little backhanded love. I'm not sure what's going to happen, well, but every time he says anything that nice, you just wait for the other shoe to drop, don't you? Something's coming. That's it is. Exactly right. It is horrible. I don't know about that, but I don't know who is coming from the desert. Outside of Las Vegas or in Las Vegas, Nevada, it's our friend Paula Pant. Absolutely. I am here. It is a balmy 71 degrees. Stop and it. I'm loving life. That's enough. I'm wearing, a, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm like wearing a tank top. Uh, no, um, no. Yeah, it's, all sweaty. It's happening. Easy. <laughs> Everybody's all sweaty except for you and I, Joe, L- here in the basement. Right? Leave, leave it alone. Just <laughs> Paula, that's horrible talk. And a guy who's in, holy crap, he's in Arizona. What? Who invited him from the Successfully Unemployed podcast? Dustin Hayner joins us. How are you, man? I'm fantastic. Actually, I'm super nervous to be on the show because I've been listening for so long and all of a sudden I'm on the show. I feel so, so privileged. Thank you guys for having me. Well, Paula OG and I are nervous because you're here and it's like we've got royalty here with this man because the dude from the Successfully Unemployed podcast is here. Well, I was one of the two listeners that you guys have, so I, I'm I'm ready to go. <laughs> there it is. See, that's what we're looking for. Dustin's not nice to us, so we believe him. Un, unlike unlike Doug, but tell everybody about the show because successfully employed, you just had a fantastic launch. Uh, what about a month and a half ago? And you've just been roaring. Tell everybody. I invest in real estate rental properties myself. I quit when I was 37 years old, quit quit working a job. I had 30 plus properties and I started teaching people how to do that. On top of that, I realized not everybody wanted to invest in real estate. So I decided to do a podcast where I interview awesome people like you, Joe, and many other entrepreneurs, side hustle experts, investors, and every single which way that they can find a way so that they can quit their J-O-B. And I say J-O-B is just over broke because we live just over broke. And we're going to talk about that today. But what's crazy is as I'm interviewing so many entrepreneurs and business owners and investors and seeing how they have built their businesses, I've learned so much. And so it's all about interviewing people who literally do not work a job and still make money to provide for their family. And so that's everything about Successfully Unemployed. I just wish you had energy. That's what I think the problem is with the show is a lack of that all the time. Man, I got to work on that. (laughs) If you need energy, a great place to go to get some motivation is our Stacker newsletter, Dustin. Head to stackybedjamins.com forward slash Stacker. And there you will not only get a bunch of lessons from my life of speaking about uh, broke, being just over broke. I wasn't just over broke. I was just under broke and had to figure that out. So over a course of episodes, we tell that story. We also let you know what's happening in the basement and As uh, OG and I travel around the country, 
Also, if we have meetups, stackingbenjamins.com forward slash stacker. We've got a fantastic show. We got Dustin here. We got Paula here. We got OG. Doug's being nice for some reason. Not sure what that's about. So let's get the party started. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamins headlines. And our headline today comes to us from Of Dollars and Data, Personal Finance Using Data Analysis. This totally seems like Len's thing, and he's and Len's not here. But I'll tell you who is here. We'd like that people read these to us. My old partner over at the Money Tree Podcast, Miranda Marquit, is here, and she is going to read us this piece by Nick Maguli. The Biggest Lie in Personal Finance by Nick Maguli. Why cutting spending isn't the key to financial independence. Last week, Michael Batnick brought the following article to my attention. Opinion. I retired at 35 by following these principles. It's not that hard. Yeah, it triggered me. It triggered me because without even reading the article, I knew these five rules have little to do with how they retired at 35. How do I know this? Because of all of these early retirement articles are the same. They all say things like, make it a goal, track your expenses, establish a system, blah, blah, blah. But none of these things are the actual reason for the how they retired early, because the actual reason is either one, earning a high income, or two, having an absurdly low level of spending, or both. In the case of the blogger that wrote this article mentioned above, I don't know his income history, but I knew, do know that... He lives full-time in his 30-foot Airstream Classic. It's too bad that one of his five rules wasn't retire in a trailer. But seriously, his advice has little to nothing to do with how he retired early. The reason his advice misses the mark is simple. All the expense tracking and goal setting in the world cannot make up for an insufficient balance. Don't just take my word for it, though. Consider what the Consumer Expenditure Survey from the Bureau of Labor Statistics has to say. A look at the data. For example, if you look at the percentage of after-tax income that the poorest 20% of households spend on food, housing, healthcare, and transportation, it becomes quite clear that low income is the problem here. Note that this doesn't include any money for education, clothing, or any form of entertainment. Just the necessities swallow their entire paycheck and then some. Considering that their annual after-tax income is, on average, only $11,700, it's likely that many of these individuals are younger and less experienced than the typical American household. Because we don't know the age or household size of these income cohorts, the comparisons are not necessarily apples to apples. Despite this, the next 20% of U.S. households aren't that much better off than the bottom 20%. For example, though the next 20% of U.S. households have an annual after-tax income about three times higher than the lowest 20% at $31,200, they still spend most of their income on the necessities. Meanwhile, the highest 20% of U.S. households with an average income of $162,000 spend only about half of their take-home pay on the basics. If we include expenses outside the essentials, it looks like roughly half of all U.S. households spent more than they earned in 2018. This is an unfortunate reality, but one that more clearly demonstrates why so many U.S. households find it difficult to save money. They end up spending most of their pay just on the basics. The biggest lie. After seeing data like this, it's hard for me to understand how any sort of expense tracking, goal setting, or system is going to fix it. Yes, some percentage of U.S. households don't have the knowledge or habits or mindset to improve their financial situation. You can probably think of a few people like this from your personal life. But remember, N equals 1. While there are lots of people who are in financial trouble because of their own actions, there are also lots of people with good financial habits who just don't have sufficient income to improve their finances. 
That's why the biggest lie in personal finance is that you can be rich if you just cut your spending. And the financial media feeds this lie by telling you to stop spending $5 a day on coffee so you can become a millionaire. However, these same pundits conveniently forgot to mention that this is only possible if you are earning 12% annualized returns, something that is far outside the norm of 8 to 10% a year. Even if you could get 12% annualized returns, you would need to earn these returns while holding a 100% stock portfolio without panicking for decades. It's easy in theory, but difficult in practice. This is the same financial media who writes stories about how people save money by living in a trailer, making their own dish soap, or reusing their dental floss. Yes, it's that ridiculous. But what really gets me is how these examples are provided as proof of how cutting spending can make you rich. Just think about how condescending this message is to the typical American family. The author of these posts might as well say, see you poor b- The reason you aren't financially free is because you keep buying the Tide Pods. But most of us can see the trick they're playing on us. We know that they are using exceptional cases and presenting them as some sort of validation of their lie. It's run-of-the-mill financial pornography. Despite this, many of us keep reading these articles. I think we keep reading them because we want to believe there is some secret to getting rich. But as I have said before, there are no secrets. Actually, the only secret that I know to get rich is to grow your income and invest in income-producing assets. Of course, this is far easier said than done. The best way to grow your income is to increase your human capital and keep increasing it, full stop. And you don't have to learn to code either. There are many other options. For example, I saw this tweet about someone who learned 10 advanced Excel formulas on YouTube and was able to increase her income by $20,000 in just a few nights of studying. But not everyone can do every job. But I believe that most people can escape from poverty if they put in the work. Instead of trying to convince everyone that they can be rich, we should be trying to convince everyone that they can be not poor. Now that would be the start to undoing the biggest lie in personal finance. Honest Early Retirement Articles. I didn't know how to end this post, so I started to ask myself, what if the financial media never distorted the truth in their articles? If so, what would an honest early retirement article headline sound like? How about, want to retire at 27? Marry rich. Or maybe, top ramen, is it your new retirement strategy? And finally, foregoing procreation, living like a hermit, and four other ways to retire in your 30s. Special thanks to Ramp Capital for assisting with these honest retirement headlines, and thank you for reading. You can follow Of Dollars and Data via Twitter, Instagram, or the weekly newsletter. Cutting spending, not the key to personal finance. Say it ain't so, Paula. Cutting spending. It is so. It is so. I mean, at the risk of sounding like Captain Obvious, and I have said this for years, what you need to do is build the gap between what you make and what you spend. And the only way to build that gap is by either making more, spending less, or some combination of the two. It's exactly what he says. And when I read this, I was like, dude, you're preaching to the choir. I get it. But why then, Dustin, so often when we read articles the way that Nick starts us out, like Miranda so eloquently just read to us, why why do we always hear from people that retired early about cutting expenses? They cut expenses. They cut expenses. And it wasn't that hard. If that's not really the key, why do we always hear that? I think it's the easiest way to go. Like the easiest thing to say and think people can mostly do this. Now, what's interesting though, is I'm very, very frugal. I'm blessed to have plenty of money. I got properties and I got businesses and I have plenty of money, but I'm still very frugal. In fact, one of my tenants were moving out of their house. I was living in California, expensive California, moved to Arizona. My tenants were moving out. And so I said, Hey, let's just move in Arizona. It's a 1200 square foot house. So I completely agree with what he's saying, but at the same time, Parts of me are like, oh, I don't know about this because I know as I've cut my expenses, life just got easier. But I want to give you one thing. As I was reading this, what really got me was it got me thinking of, so we have four kids. Our fourth child had just been born and 
I went on paternity leave. So I'm off for maybe a week that I was working a regular job. I was off for about a week. I get back and it's a Friday, like around 3.30 in the afternoon. I get a phone call from my boss's, boss's, boss's secretary. It says, Dustin, would you please come to the office, come to the boss's office. I hung up the phone. I said, okay. And I hung up the phone and I sit there and I'm thinking, what in the world? Why are they calling me? This is weird. So I get up and I start walking down the hallway. It feels like a really long hallway, but it's really not. And as I'm walking, I'm remembering a little bit of rumors. As I was going on paternity leave, I heard somebody say there might be layoffs. And that hit me. I was like, oh no, I completely didn't think about that. And as I'm walking down the hall, my feet feel like they're just getting heavier and heavier, almost like lead bricks. I finally get to my boss's office and I sit down. The secretary looks at me. She sheepishly kind of grins and said, would you please have a seat? So I sit down and she knows what's going on, but I don't. So I'm just sitting there. I'm starting to sweat because I'm starting to realize this might be something that might be actually happened to me. My hands get all clammy. I start sweating, then opens the door to my boss's office and out walks a lady holding a piece of paper. She's noticeably distraught, noticeably upset. And she walks out and the boss ushers me into his office. Oh boy. Lo and behold, I actually get laid off. I get laid off and I start walking back to my desk. I have four kids. I don't have anything else. And I'm, as I'm walking back, I'm realizing, number one, I need to get another job. Number two, I need to start figuring out a way to never let this happen again. So the last part of that is I was able to start investing in real estate. But the first part was I found a job fairly quickly. But here's the thing. Out of all that, it's a true saying, and I'm absolutely living a test. And I'll pause that. I work for the government. Who gets laid off from the government? I did. I, I, nobody gets fired or laid off from the government, but it happened to me. So all that to say, it's, it's not if you lose your job, it's when. And if you just cut expenses and cut expenses and you don't try to get money coming in, like an inflow of money, it's eventually going to happen and you're going to be stuck if you just try to cut expenses. So I'm, I'm a little on the fence of both sides, but I'm also heavily in, into making more money. Oh, gee, it's funny. As Dustin was talking, I was thinking about what you and I talked about last week on the show about this Robert Allen quote that keeps coming up over and over again. He says there's two doors in life. One says opportunity and one says security. And the person who reaches for the security door gets neither. I mean, Dustin works for the government, the most secure thing on earth and yet still gets laid off. I think that's that seems to be a recurring theme. Yeah. What Nick was talking about here in his article was not only the impact of trying to cut expenses when you've already tried to cut them to the bone, and it's easy to do, and I think his point is it's easy to cut expenses when you're spending $300,000 a year. It's easy to find something. But if you're if you're spending or earning forty or fifty thousand dollars a year, it's a lot more difficult to make a meaningful impact for your saving. And I think that we don't give it enough energy around, although Dustin certainly brought enough energy <laughs> a few seconds ago, but we don't give it enough energy to focus on the other side of the income statement. You know, we talked so much about, yeah, I can retire, I can be financially independent, I've got three hundred thousand dollars in the bank and at the four percent rule, that's a thousand bucks a month. And look how great life is. I'm, I'm retired. The reality is, is that the other side of that equation warrants just as much emphasis as the cutting of expenses side, you know, and what Dustin was saying here, you know, go out and find income to bridge the gap between those things. Cause eventually I'm guessing you got to the point very quickly where you're like, well, I don't need the job anymore. My money is now doing enough to make money that I don't need to go personally go do this thing that makes money anymore. And then that's the definition of financial independence in my book. And certainly cutting expenses, I'm sure Dustin helped you do that. But four kids, you ever think about cutting that back to two? <laughs> <laughs> no, in fact, my wife, if we had not taken care of that by uh, getting fixed, we'd have at least three or four more now. So we're we're, we're good. But uh, no, my wife, she's more of a kid person. So that would be a good plan, though. But it is interesting because you hear this debate a lot for people is that a lot of people who are the the faces of a lot of the early retirement movement don't have kids or only have one kid. I would think that having four children, Dustin, seriously, even though you're frugal, makes it a little bit more difficult to not have a full-time J-O-B. Yeah, it, it really does. But here's the funny thing. See, I have the easy job of making money. My wife has a hard job of homeschooling. So she homeschools all our four kids. She's amazing. She's a hard worker. And as I've been building my business in real estate, buying 30 plus properties, I finally just have enough money where I didn't need to work. So I quit. And then I thought, 
I thought there's so many other ways. And so as I've been interviewing great people on the Successful Unemployed Show, I found out there is there, even taco truck vendors make plenty of money. They don't have to work a job. I, I interviewed a lady who sells bridal dresses. I mean, there's so many different ways, not just online, there's offline. There's so many great ways to make money. So I believe you absolutely need to increase your income, especially if you're going to expand your family that there's more mouths to eat, uh, to feed and all that sort of stuff. So I agree. You need to keep getting that income growing up. Well, that's the thing, Paula, is that one thing that Miranda read was this piece that Nick wrote about, about, about just basic expenses. You and I, Paula, we hear all the time about the fire movement, the financial independence, retire early movement, get some stank Mm -hmm. from people about, Hey, these are just high income people that, Mm -hmm. that made so much money that they were able to retire early. A lot of the time people I read are kind of embarrassed about that and go, no, 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 no. It doesn't have to be that way. Why wouldn't you just answer? Yes. Making a lot of money early is a great part of the fire movement. Like learn how to make more cash so you can do whatever the hell you want. Oh, 100%. 100%. I mean, the reason that so many people in the fire movement talk about cutting expenses is because they are starting from a place in which they have a six-figure W-2 job. They have a W-2 job with a regular salary in which they're making $100,000 a year, $120,000, $150,000. Maybe they're married and their combined household income is getting up closer to one seventy. 180, 190, you know, so when we're talking about that level of income, I mean, from their perspective, sure, if you like cut out the trips to Applebee's and eat at home instead, well, guess what? Now all that money that you just spent at Applebee's is now savings, you know, and you cut out the manicures and you cut out the golf clubs and you cut out the whatever, whatever. And all of a sudden, bada bing, bada boom, you've got money to invest. That is very appealing to the segment of the population that shares that life experience and not at all applicable and in fact, misleading for the segment of the population that's making 30 grand a year, right? You just, you can't save half of your money when you make 30 grand a year. You just can't. So I think it's critical that we acknowledge that at a certain point, you just cannot frugal yourself down to greatness. Um, You can't shrink your way down to greatness. You've got to earn more. Uh, Where'd you hear that from, Paula? That came from a guy whose initials are JSS. (laughs) And he hosts a a, a podcast. I think it's called Piling Washingtons, maybe, or um, Assembling... Hamilton's assembling Hamilton's fine (laughs) name for the show. Dustin, I think you hit it on the head and I love what Paul is saying is that it's gotta be both. Like if you keep making more and more and more money, but you don't have good financial controls, you're not going to go anywhere. I completely agree. Um, What I did for my life was figured out how to not overspend because as you start getting money coming in, what's the downside of that is you start to having your standard of living go up and you start spending more and you don't save and you eventually you're back at the same place because you're spending a lot of money. Now, I spend a good amount of money. In fact, we, my wife and I, we love to travel with our four kids. Like last year, we went all over the East Coast for you four t- weeks driving. You took this awesome trip. It was so fun following you on Instagram. It was such a blast. Yeah, so we love spending money, but we're also frugal on other ends. But what we love spending money is traveling. Started in Florida, then drove all the way four weeks. A huge history lesson. Remember, we homeschool our kids. So we're doing history all the way up, up to New York City and Washington, D.C., and then flew back. But the year prior, we did six weeks in Europe for 11 different countries. The year before that, we went six weeks in Japan because we wanted to drive all around Japan. And next year, we're going to go to Italy for six weeks. It takes a lot out of you. It's a very tiring. It's a, it's a hard problem to have, being very tired traveling. But it's because I have extra money that I, I don't have to do without. And I like one thing that he wrote in the article. It's not about just cutting out a latte or cutting out a cappuccino once a day or once a week to actually makes you wealthy or rich. It's not that. It's earning more money and not just earning, but making more money where it didn't ex- exist with starting a business, buying a rental property or doing whatever it might be to increase the amount of money that you have. But being able to spend it on the things that you want to spend it on. Oh, gee, looking at your wealthiest clients, there's got to be some habits that you see over and over, like to Nick's point here about either the amount that they save or the amount that they spend that you keep seeing. What are some of the big habits you see among your most successful clients? Well, I think Dustin was talking about it in terms of lifestyle creep, and it's and it's something that is very, very insidious. It's hard to keep your fingers on it. 
I know that from a personal experience, it's pretty easy. You know, the whole rich dad, poor dad concept of every time you make more money, you just go kind of, you know, it's time to move into a nicer neighborhood or, or a bigger house in the neighborhood or whatever. And you kind of do that and you get, you can easily get trapped by that. And so I think from a successful standpoint, people don't do that. They kind of baseline their expenses. And then if they happen to have a business or rental properties or a good bonus or something like that, that doesn't fall to the bottom line in terms of excess or in terms of spending, rather, it falls to the bottom line in terms of savings, you know, it goes automatically into their, into their saving or investing bucket. I think probably the biggest common denominator is around house purchases. When we talk to people about buying homes, you and I, both owned houses during 2007 and 2008 in Michigan. So it was like the epicenter of like getting your face kicked in in the real estate market. And now here we are 10, 11 years later, and the memory of that is completely gone, just like the stock market declining. The memory of, you know, God's not making any more land, get it while you can, all of that stuff. Yeah, I hear it and it's crazy. But what's funny is, is that when we look at those those things objectively, if we're trying to sell ourselves, we look at it from the perspective of like, okay, you know, I live in an apartment right now. I'm spending twelve hundred dollars a month on my apartment. If I bought a house, I could buy a three hundred thousand dollar house for twelve hundred bucks a month. Maybe that's true. Maybe the math works out, and that's the principal and interest payment. But you forget about taxes and insurance and upkeep and the fact that three hundred thousand dollar houses have. AC units that need replacing every so often and parts on the fan blades that blow. I mean, there's just always something that's going on in your house. And so when people plateau there and just say, okay, this is our house, Dustin, like you did, you just say, okay, this is where we live now. You didn't say, hey, cool, I make all this money. I can afford a million dollar house in the cool, fancy golf course neighborhood because you can. You just said, no, we're, this is where our living expenses are. Then as your income continues to grow, you start capitalizing on it or you have the ability to capitalize on that. And I think the other side of it is they take that extra money and make it produce money. So that money, you know, you're talking about, Dustin, using stuff for experiences and spending money on experiences instead of stuff is a really important thing. But taking that extra money and saying, okay, now this money has a job now. This money has to go do something to generate more money, whether that's dividends in my investment portfolio, whether that's leverage in my real estate portfolio so that it can produce uh, cash flow or something like that. It's not just sitting in a bank. It's not just sitting in a mattress. It very intentionally has a purpose for this you know, I've got this 50 grand, it needs to go do something to go earn its keep, so to speak. Kind of like what you probably do with your kids. Well, at least what I do with mine. (laughs) (laughs) You're three now, Caroline, you can go earn your keep. (laughs) And I suggest selling lemonade out front. You got all four four kids out working now, Dustin. Is that your secret? Is that how you're successfully employed? You put all four kids to work? They are out there pulling up like strawberries and like they're they're picking the, uh, the all the fruit in the field and everything. Yes, that's that's my number. I want more kids. In fact, that's the reason why I want more kids. You're gonna as well. start. You're gonna start a farm. Exactly. A farming community. Them. They're doing yep. all the work. I mean, that's funny. My dad is one of 16 kids. And that's how it was. Yeah. And they were a big farming family, man. And they, I mean, they were all labor. They were all, all the kids were, were labor. So free labor at that. Yeah. Right. Dustin, you mentioned this earlier. How big did you say the house is that you moved into? 1,250 square feet. With six of you. With the six of us. Now we will eventually buy something bigger, but right now it's a pretty high market in the real estate market. I just know if I buy anything right now, eventually it's going to correct and it'll come back down. It's been 10 years, literally of just up climb of the market. So I figure we're fine right here. It's okay. We'd rather have a bigger place. It's just the way it is. But when the market does correct, oh my goodness, I'll be able to buy something really nice. And by the way, just for everybody listening, what you can't see what we see, we have video on our shortwave and Dustin's family's huddled in the other side of the room and <laughs> has been told to be quiet while we're recording Shh, this. Be quiet. <laughs> yeah, he's out of I mean, that's honestly, box again. yeah, that's no joke. I literally tell it, be quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Just for the, the next hour, Paula, I want to skip to the bottom piece of this and get your feeling about this sentence. Nick writes, the best way to grow your income is to increase your human capital and keep increasing it full stop. Well, if by human capital, he means your your skill set, then I would 100% absolutely agree with that. I will make the 
kind of more nuanced explanation that I think for this audience, for the Stacking Benjamins audience or the Assembling Hamilton's audience probably goes without saying, which is that increasing your skills and increasing your knowledge um, and your ability to do things is not limited to only formal education. There are many ways outside of going back to grad school that you can increase your both your knowledge and your skill set. So um, adopting an attitude of lifelong learning and then having the courage to implement that, the confidence to implement that and to iterate. Yes, I 100% agree. That's how you make money, whether lo- actively or passively. I, I love the idea of creating your own curriculum, like learning what you need to know. Forget about the degree. Just learn learn what you need to know. Dustin, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, sorry. yeah. I love the idea of human capital, you learning. But at the same time, I also take it one step to the side a little bit. Human capital, also the people that you know. I met somebody recently who said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to email this one gentleman who has a fantastic business. I'm going to email him over and over again because we're not in the same city. Email him over and over again and ask him, can I work for you for free? I want to just work and work and work so I can learn. Now he's got a big, he's actually partnering with this guy, this big business guy on another big business because he started just having the human capital of reaching out and networking and finding other people. Because I found as all of my businesses grow, it's only because I work with other people. I network with other people. So here's, if you tie everything back to me losing my job, I got another job really, really quickly in in the government again, which was great. But what I did was I told myself, I'm never going to let this happen to me again. So instead of Telling anybody, if anybody ever asked me, well, Dustin, what do you do? I used to say, oh, I work for the government. I do IT work for the government. Instead, from that point forward, I said, I am an investor. My value is what I give myself, not from my job. So it's either from my God, my family, or from myself. And so I said, now I am an investor. From that, I had so many people wanting to give me properties or sell me properties, wanting to invest with me, give me money to invest with. And so everybody listening, your value is not from your job. Your value is from inside of you, who you are. Is that why OG calls himself the emperor of this podcast? Is that why? Are you asking me? Because it, it seems like it. <laughs> I, I don't. I I often wonder I that. I value myself very highly sometimes. Speaking of OG, let's wrap this thing up. Uh, what's your big takeaway from this piece? Do whatever you can to make more money. The one thing that is true is that you can only cut your expenses to zero. That's the bottom line. You could live on nothing. Well, you really can't, but that's the far as far as you can go. But there's no limit to the amount of money that you make. So if you want to travel the world for six weeks in Europe with your four kids, you just have to figure out how much it costs and go make the money. Now, that's easier said than done. I get that. But, you know, Dustin didn't start with 30 rental properties. He started with zero and then got one and then got two. It's step by step making progress toward this goal that you have. So go make some money. Paula? Have the confidence to push yourself to earning more. Frugality is tempting because there's no risk of failure. You can't fail at getting a coupon for fabric softener. But taking a risk, putting yourself out there, trying to sell a product or a service, trying to make an investment in an asset class that you have no experience in, that's scary. And so have the confidence and the courage to earn more because that's where the potential is, despite the fact that that's also that's the place that is outside of your comfort zone. And therefore, people don't talk about it as much. You don't know Doug very well. I bet he's failed at trying to get that fabric softener coupon, Paula. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah, he's been trying for weeks. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> scanning every news he spent like $87 in newspapers right. looking through each one to try to find a paper coupon to clip for 50 you know, cents yeah you know what's funny is yesterday literally my wife my wife's very frugal she's taught me to be even more frugal she had our kids you think about them putting them to work they are literally making laundry detergent she has bars of soap they're grinding it and doing all that sort of stuff so absolutely it's something that my family does <laughs> all right and, and that's why I'm glad this it doesn't have smell-o-vision attached to it, Dustin, right there. Well, it smell good. It smell really good. It smells all perfumey. Absolutely. Uh, Dustin, being the guest, we'll give you the last word. What's your big takeaway? There's one sentence in here that it was really, really good. Is Actually, the only secret that I know to get rich is to grow your income and invest in income-producing assets. 
I completely and wholeheartedly agree with that. As I bought one property and started making $350 from that one property in passive income, like that's literally not working. I work 30 minutes a month. And so as I bought the next property, more money came in. And as I bought the next property, more money came in and I kept saving to buy that next property. So yes, you need to buy income producing assets. I think out of anything, that is the biggest takeaway. Jason Parker not only is a uh, fantastic financial planner out in the Seattle area, he also has Sound Retirement Radio, which is not only on the radio, but also is a podcast that you can listen to wherever you're listening here to us. Jason last year was on talking about his retirement budget calculator. And I know a lot of you started using that calculator. It was something I saw in our Facebook group, people using and talking about, and it was really exciting. Well, Jason is back because they've made lots of updates, like he talked about a year ago. We want to talk more about his calculator and retirement. So on today's Friday FinTech segment, let's say hello to our good friend, Jason Parker. And on his way back down to the basement from the Sound Retirement Podcast. Mr. Jason Parker's back. How are you, dude? Joe, thank you so much for having me back. I'm doing great. Well, I'm glad that you're here in from Seattle, in one cold place to another this time of year. This basement's looking better and better all the time. You must be making like big bucks off this uh, Stacking Benjamin show. It, as you know, that's where all the money is. <laughs> all the money in the world is in podcasting, my friend. Um, one of these days you're your own TV show. You're going to be like the next Jerry Seinfeld of finance. I can, I see it. You're sitting here looking at me. You know, I have a face for radio. That's why we do audio <laughs> it's because of that. Let's get serious for a moment. You were on here about a year ago. And if anybody has exploded our Friday FinTech segment, it was you um, because discussion in our basement Facebook group about your calculator discussions all over the place. I read about people using it and, and, and loving it and how comprehensive it is. Conversations about how even over the course of last year, you kept adding onto it and adding onto it and adding onto it to make it better. A lot has changed in the last year, so I wanted to, uh, well, for people that are new to the retirement budget calculator and also for people that know what it is but maybe don't know a ton about it, tell us, A, what it is, and B, how it's changed since we saw you last. Joe, I've been a financial advisor helping people walk life into retirement for more than 15 years. I think I'm getting close to 20 years now. You're an old guy. And I've seen it go really well for people, and I've seen it go really poorly for people. And when it usually blows up, it's not because of their savings or investment performance. It's usually because they overspend. And oftentimes they head into retirement, they really don't know how much they're spending. They don't have that number really dialed in. So when I first started building this calculator, I just wanted to give people a tool that was going to give them more accuracy in terms of these future projections, understanding their spending. It's not another Quicken. It's not another Mint. This is not another YNAB. This is a tool specifically designed for, I would say, people are really passionate about or people that are in that FIRE community, you know, people that are financially independent, retired early. Because again, if you look at somebody like Mr. Money Mustache, he only had saved about a million dollars before he retired. The reason he's able to retire so early is because he's radical about his spending. The guy, he, he rides a bike to work instead of driving a car. And so the retirement budget calculator started out being radical about understanding spending, but not just your spending today, how that's going to change over time. Because a lot of people, when they retire, they want to travel more. So we got to increase the travel budget. They've got a mortgage that's a fixed expense. It's not going to go up with inflation. It's going to get paid off at a future time. And I, what I found was there was no tool out there that allowed people to model their spending. It's the number one most important thing that people need to understand is how much do you spend? There's actually three important numbers, but that's the most important. Well, okay, come on. You can't leave us with one. Everybody's sitting there. I know somebody's out there running this morning or whatever time you're listening and they're going, okay, Jason, what are the other two then? Give us the good stuff. <laughs> right. So, okay. Uh, number one is spending. You got to understand your spending. Once you understand your spending, you can do a real simple exercise. If you want to follow the 4% rule, take whatever your annual spending is, multiply it by 25 and it'll give us an idea if you've saved enough for retirement. 
But the next piece is we have to understand how much you've saved. We have to understand your net worth, your liquid investable net worth, not just your, not including real estate and, and assets that aren't necessarily producing income for you because retirement's all about cash flow. And then the third number that we've built into the retirement budget calculator is time. So we have to have some idea of how long you're going to live. And the way that we do that is we use the uh, data from the Social Security Administration. So we're giving people an actuarial look based on a large group of people, how long they may live. So, for example, if you're 65 years old today, you've lived 23,725 days. If you live to life expectancy as a 65-year-old man in the United States, you've got about 6,205 days remaining. One of the reasons this is so important, Joe, is what most people are trying to understand is, is my money going to last as long as we will? Can we have the lifestyle that we want in retirement? But the other thing is we want to create some urgency for people because they, I meet with people all the time that will continue to work to 70 and beyond thinking they have all the time in the world. And the reality is time is your most precious asset. So we, we want to encourage and inspire people to recognize that you may not have forever and you, you want to live your best life right now. And so those are the three numbers. Really be granular about your spending. Number two is really understand your liquid net worth, what's going to support your income and other cash flows if you have real estate investments. And then number three, how long does the money need to last? We've built all three of those components into the calculator. So again, when I built this thing originally, it was all about being just fanatical about spending. Some of the things that make the spending side, the budgeting side unique is number one, uh, you can assign a different inflation factor for every expense. So, for example, if you have a mortgage, your taxes and insurance will go up over time, but the mortgage payment, the principal and interest, that's going to be a static payment. It's going to get paid off in a future point. So we don't inflate all of your expenses. But things like health care, maybe you want to assume more like a 5 or 6% inflation factor on health care. So we just need to understand that not all expenses are going to increase the same way over time. And then we allow you to start and stop expenses. Maybe the first 10 years of retirement, you're going to, you're going to spend, you know, an extra 10 or $20,000 on travel. Well, you, but you want to see that expense going away 10 years down the road. Retirement budget calculator allows you to do that. And, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it's just, it's a very comprehensive tool. I'm really excited. One, I don't know if I told you this or not, but I have a friend, I think a mutual friend actually, um, Roger Whitney, and he has something called the rock retirement club. And Roger uh, sent me an email the other day and he said, Jason, you know, I did a blind survey of my Rock Retirement Club members and I just asked them, what's your favorite calculator out there for retirement planning? Uh, he came back and said they, it wasn't multiple choice. It was just fill in the blank. And overwhelmingly, Retirement Budget Calculator won. And here's what one of his customers wrote to me, one of his Rock Retirement Club members. He said, I've been using your program and I'm enthralled. I have looked at about 40 different retirement programs, but never found one with such specificity and predictability. P.S. You might want to know that you won the Rock Retirement Club survey of the best calculators. <laughs> but you probably knew that. So, I mean, the cool thing is we really are building a community. We're, we're building a tribe. And one of the things I want to make your listeners aware of, you're right, we've been adding on to the calculator. We've added some new features that I want to tell you about in a minute. But it's not done. I mean, we keep building it, keep making it better, making it better, and making it better. And so when you become a part of the retirement budget calculator community, when you sign up and you pay for the calculator, I want people to know that the money that they're spending for the calculator has given us the resources to continue to build it. So if they're just looking to try to get a good deal, get in, try this thing out, and then get back out again, we've made that really easy for them to opt out. So we give people a 14-day free trial before they're charged anything. So if they can, they can get into the calculator and if they don't like it, if it doesn't meet their expectations and they can just cancel, uh, during those first 14 days and we won't charge them anything. Ever since I was a financial planner, I've been looking for robust calculators and planning tools. And it's always been frustrating to me, Jason, like it may be for you on the consumer side, I didn't get anywhere near the robustness that I wanted. And, and, and I'll give you an example. And I actually like this tool. Fidelity has a, has a retirement tool that gives you red light, yellow light, green light based on how you're doing for retirement. And I like it and it's super simple, but the number of assumptions under the hood are mind bending. And I'm not yeah. really sure where that number comes from. I'm not sure exactly why. And for anybody that asks the number why, and this is not a knock on fidelity. I think it's a fine tool that people just want just a free, quick glimpse. But if you're really serious about planning your retirement, I think being able to turn on and off income, I think is a big thing, right? Where your income source is going to come from being able to turn on and off expenses, like you said, and then also I think people don't understand enough this idea that different things inflate at different 
at different numbers. Yeah. As an example, I mean, you know, cost of college. If you had a child late in life and you've got to plan college a few years into retirement for somebody, even for yourself, man, if you're not inflating that at what, seven or eight percent, you're screwing up. Man, you know who's wor the worst people at this? Because I, again, I get to walk life with a lot of real people on this journey into retirement. People that are really high income. So the doctors, the dentists, the pilots, the engineers, people that are making a couple, several hundred thousand dollars a year are the worst at really understanding their spending. And they're the ones at the biggest risk of running out of money in retirement. And let me tell you what, if you saved $10 million, but you're spending seven, $800,000 a year, you've got the same problem as the guy that saved a million dollars that's spending 60 or $70,000 a year, right? It's what happens for so many of us is as our income goes up, our life, our spending goes up. A friend of mine once said, the luxuries of yesterday become the necessities of today. And there's just so many things that we spend on that we don't even think about. Like, for example, my wife, we she has this Honda Pilots paid for. We don't owe anything on it. But just the other day, I had to bring it in for a 75,000-mile tune-up and do the oil change. And uh, I can't even remember everything we did, but it was a $2,000 expense. Those types of things happen all the time. Most people don't include it as part of their spending plan, and it really blows up their life. But so the spending is so key, but what really set the the retirement budget calculator up, I mean, when people really got started to get fanatical about this was when we, uh, we created something called the future view tab, because when you know the spending then, and you know the assets and you know the time frame, then you can put this all on, in a sheet, uh, it kind of looks like a spreadsheet and you can, you can say, okay, here's my spending at year 62, 63, 64, 65. Here's how it's going to change every year. And then you can see, here's how much assets we have. Here's the shortfall between the income we have coming in and the expense going out. Here's the withdrawals that we're going to have to take from the retirement portfolio to make the numbers work. And then we have to make some assumptions about rate of return. And we give people different ways to model that. So what we do is we say, look, if you just want to assume a simple 3% return every year, you can plug that in. If you want to use like a 60-40 uh, stock bond portfolio and model the performance of how that would have worked over time, you can plug that in. And so we're just allowing people to really understand these numbers. And this is not a tool. If people aren't numbers oriented, my wife is an artist. She's not into numbers. So for people that are not numbers oriented, I would say this is probably not the right tool for them. But people that really want to understand, they want to have a greater sense of confidence as they're getting ready to make this transition into retirement. That is what the calculator is really going to help yeah. people do, have a better understanding of how the numbers are going to work. Joe, the other piece that we just recently added to the calculator is something called the buckets tab. A popular idea for cash flow in retirement is that people want to diversify their money based on when they're going to spend it. So the idea is money that you need in the short term, the first one to three years, say, you want that money to be relatively low risk, safe, secure, and guaranteed, maybe just in a high yield savings account or a money market account, somewhere you, where you can't lose, right? Because you're, you're going to be using that money for income withdrawals. So what we built into the retirement budget calculator is we say, okay, assign, go ahead and pick which day you're going to, or which year you're going to retire. And then the calculator can, because it's smart, because we have all this data, we can say, okay, here's how much you need to allocate to bucket number one. Here's how much needs to be allocated to bucket number two. Here's how much needs to be allocated to bucket number three, because it's just taking the shortfall between spending and your assets and saying, let's allocate these resources conservative for the money that we need in the short term. And we take more risk with the money that we don't need for a long period of time. So that was another cool feature that we just recently added. Which solves a huge problem that I used to see when I was a financial planner. And I'm sure Jason, that you see this all the time is that people go one way or the other. They either a, they retire on a day and they immediately take all of their assets and they get really conservative as if you're going to spend all that money in the next 24 hours. By the way, I want to be there for that party. If you do that, if you are going to do that, please invite me. But realistically, that's not going to happen. You're only going to spend a little piece of it. And on the other side, I'm sure you see people like I used to where they forget about the short-term expenses. And then me, you know, I finished my career during the 2007, 2008, or just after that lull, uh, 2009, so we were already recovering, was when I bowed out. But during 2000, 2001, 2002, and during 2007, 2008, you'd see people that totally forgot I might need this money soon. <laughs> And they did not get out. And then they'd come see people like you or me later on and go, how do I fix this? Well, it's, it's a little late to fix that. Yeah. One of the things I wanted, before I forget, I wanted to let you know that for your community, we created a special coupon code, but it's a limited resource. And so the first 500 people that sign up using the coupon code STACKER, 
we're going to give them 50% off the annual cost. So right now it's $95 a year is the annual cost to be part of the retirement budget calculator. But for your community, for the first 500 people that sign up, it's only going to be $47.50, not just this year, but every year that they keep the calculator, they're going to get that 50% discount. So I just, I wanted to make sure you knew that we put together the special offer for your audience. But once 500 people have been hit, we got to cut it off. I can't, I'm, I'm generous, but I, you know, no. we, we do want the resources to keep building this thing. So. Come on, what's up with that? I, what, <laughs> wait, no. I do have to say too, that uh, Jason also a year ago when he and I talked, we had a long talk about the retirement budget calculator. I looked through it and we actually talked about doing something that I don't do very often, which is we are affiliated which means you also help the show when you buy the retirement budget calculator. Do not buy this as a donation to Stacking Benjamins. Just send me money. But if you need, <laughs> but if you need a, if you need a calculator, I was very happy to get behind this calculator, and I was so happy to see the number of people that a year ago bought it and the success that they've had, and how robust it's been. It's in, and how it, it it's continually it's continually getting even more robust. I'll put it up against any calculator that you can find on the consumer side already, and yet you're still you've got stuff you're working on now that um, is going to make it even better. Yeah, let me tell you one of the biggest shortfalls of the calculator right now today. It has to do with taxes. So the way that we have taxes, that's a shortfall for all of us. Taxes, but. <laughs> Well, the taxes, the way that we built it is as a dollar amount. So a lot of people understand how much they're paying in taxes because they can look at their pay stub and see the dollar amount that's being deducted on each pay stub. But the retirement budget calculator, you have to have some knowledge of how much money you're going to pay in taxes in terms of dollars. And then on that future view tab, we, we're going to give you the ability to have an idea if your effective tax rate looks reasonable. But that's an area that I would say is a shortfall. You, I mean, you have to enter in numbers. So I always tell people when in doubt, enter more than what you think it is just to be on the safe side. Yeah. Almost like with Social Security, you try to plan on less right? Or, or none. You bring up a great point though. Retirement budget calculator, you can plug in social security income. You can plug in pensions. If you have income coming from uh, rental properties, you can plug that in. You can assign a different inflation factor to all of those income sources. So it is just a really robust. And like I say, I'm I'm having a ton of fun building it. Uh, The response that we're getting from our community is huge. We want people to try it. And for those first 14 days, and if it's just not what they thought it was going to be, it's okay to cancel. You do that yourself. You don't have to send an email. You just click on my account and cancel the thing and, and don't be a part of this. And I just really want to emphasize, I don't want, I really want to build a community of people that are excited. I I almost think of this as like a Kickstarter, right? It's like, we want people that are passionate about building a really good tool that's going to make their life better. And we want them to be a part of that process. If they're more of a taker than a giver, it's okay to not be a part of this thing. I'm okay with that. To get there, we've set up a link on the Stacking Benjamin site, which actually will take you right to the calculator. It's just very simple because there's only one calculator that we recommend, and it's this one. So it's stackybenjamins.com forward slash calculator. It's very, very, very simple. There's not going to be five of them or three of them or choose between these two. Stackybenjamins.com forward slash calculator takes you right there. Or even easier, when they go to sign up, just put in the coupon code STACKER and they get that special coupon code. Oh, sure. I'm talking about just going to the site, though. So they don't have to. You know how hard it is to remember retirement budget calculator? versus (laughs) versus <laughs> stacking. It's a real, it's a real, you can tell how, uh, how creative of a person I am. I'm much more of a, a numbers nerd than a uh, creative. You are creative though, my friend. So tell me, so you have a radio show slash podcast that I love. And a lot of people, maybe there's a lot of people listening that love it, but always we have people that are looking for new fun things to listen to. Tell us what's coming up on the show as well. Well, we bring experts from all over the country. I've been doing my show for 10 years, Joe, but I want to warn people they're probably going to be offended when they visit Sound Retirement Radio or Sound Retirement Planning. And the reason is, um, and I just encourage them not to listen if this is offensive to them, but I share my faith openly. And I get all these one-star reviews on iTunes because people are mad that I'm sharing positive, uplifting, encouragement stuff. So I just want to let people know that if that's offensive to them, please don't listen to the podcast because, man, those one-star reviews, they kind of tear at my heart. I just, I'm really trying to put good information out there. But I believe uh, strongly the foundation of my life, I see the world through a certain set of goggles. It's, you know, my belief system. And so for me to not share that, I just feel like that I wouldn't be genuine as a person. And I think that's 
where people really get clarity, confidence, and freedom is not from their money, but from their faith. And so for me, that's really important. So just so your listeners know, if that's offensive to them, just don't listen. Well, well, that's, <laughs> if you've seen our one star reviews, if people, you know, people always complain that they don't get enough nuggets. And I, I'll just tell you, Jason, just keep making the show for you, big guy. Just keep making the show for you. And, you know, as you've seen, you find your tribe and who's not your tribe. Yeah. And I think of it because when you record something, it has a potential to live forever. So everything I record, I think, man, someday my kids, my grandkids could be listening to this. I want it to be something that's building the world up, not tearing it down. And so, again, it's uh, I, I do think big picture there. We should start doing that here. That's some good advice. Maybe if we started making something that was a little more evergreen and built the world up more like this could be, be a, this could be a sample. decent show. <laughs> Joe, your, your show is so fun and it's lighthearted. I'm way too serious. I've got this problem. I, I can't seem to have any fun. My wife is the fun one in the group. Not me. I'm the, oh. I'm the nerd, man. Well, when you come back next year to tell us all about it, make sure you bring her along then. That would be great. <laughs> Our, our, okay. All right, man. Thanks for stopping by. And by the way, everybody, if you're walking the dog or you're on your commute, we have you covered. We'll have not just sound retirement uh, radio and links to Jason's practice in his office, but also the retirement budget calculator on our show notes page at stackybedjamins.com. Jason, great talking to you again, my friend. Thank you so much. Hey there, I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And are you ready for my amazing trivia yeah i know you are because this is the best little part of the show ain't it okay let's uh let's get this party started shall we you know today's dentist day and i don't know about you but to get my money's worth i always eat a sleeve of oreos and not brush my teeth before i go to the dentist do you well that always means that while i get some quality chair time with my dentist larry later i always need to take an aspirin after the visit too much of a good thing? Yeah, maybe. So here's your question. On today's date, Bayer trademarked aspirin. We'll give you that, but here's your question. In what year? All right. We explained the convoluted rules to this game to Dustin backstage. Dustin, you got the convoluted rules? Understand exactly what we're doing here? No. <laughs> perfect. <laughs> absolutely perfect. Well, the first thing is we're playing a year-long competition, Dustin. You're playing on behalf of our good friend Len Penzo, whose birthday is the day that we're recording this. Happy birthday to Len. So he is not here with us. The score is OG has three, Len slash Dustin has two, and Paula, Paula it says you have zero here. What the hell is that about? I know, right? How do I, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. There was the one that I, there was the one. Remember it was, um. There was one. There was the one. There yes, is. there was one. You just scored one. Karen has it wrong. Cause you did, you got the one where it was just you and OG and you were closest by just a couple. Yeah, I was closest. Um, OG was 20 off of the number and I yeah. was 17 That's, off of the number. That is correct. So the score is OG three, Len uh, slash Dustin two and Paula amazingly has won, but today, Paula, maybe your comeback day. Do you want to guess first in the middle or last? I will guess last. All right. Dustin, would you like to guess in the middle or first? I'll go first. All right. So OG then second. So the date that Bear was trademarked, or excuse me, the date Bear trademarked aspirin, what year do you think that was? It seems like it was quite a long time ago. I mean, when I was born, it was still around. So I'm going to say somewhere in like, I don't know, early 1900s. Let's say, let's just say 1900. I'm going to say the year 1900, even though it's probably not it. I'm going to try to get in that area. 1900 for Dustin, OG. Yeah, I feel like it's earlier than that. We'd have to know how old Bayer was or is as a company, I'm trying to think of like, if I've ever seen any commercials of like celebrating our 150th anniversary or something. And I can't think that I've heard of anything recently. Were they like still doing like bloodletting and stuff like that in the civil war? Do you think that they, <laughs> do you think that they had aspirin back then? I, I guess I think they were still using like cocaine or something, right? Morphine too. Yeah. A little bit of morphine maybe. And then we've got trademarks. So then it's like, when was the trademark office started? So uh, this is closest to, I'm going to say 
I'm going to say it was before 1900. So I'm going to say uh, 18 and uh, 79. 1879 for OG. Whoa. Paula? I No, I am not even joking. The minute that you asked that question, the first number that popped into my head was 1880. But oh, that, and, and that, is, that has nothing to do with OG's answer. That was literally the first number that popped into my head. And, and are you still going there? Oh, well, okay. Let me think about this strategically. So you're going to parse partially Chelsea Brennan them. Then you get the 10 years between you and Dustin. Hmm. What happens if it's 1890? And so then we're uh, Dustin and I are equidistant from the answer. The good news is I know the month. And so I think we're going to pretend <laughs> oh, that, that it's, I think we're going to pretend it's January that your guess, if you say the year is January. So we'll go with the month. Oh, wow. All right. So do I want to do a partial Chelsea Brennan and have a, a birth of a decade? Uh, you know, no, I think strategically I, I want to give myself a wider window. So I'm just going to take it even further back. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, no, I see I see why this is difficult because Civil War and but then there would be probably a greater need for aspirin with soldiers returning home. Uh, oh dear. You know what? Screw it. I'm sticking with Oh, do I want to stick with 1880? Do I want to go to 1920? <laughs> Let's just go with 1920. Let's do it. <laughs> she goes to 1920. All why the not? out of the blue. Want- wow. I'm just- curious. Why would you not do like 1878, so you get anything before that, and then like 1901 and everything after, because it's the closest to. Dustin's like, why wouldn't you play the modern version of Chelsea Brennan? I know, right? Dude, dude's yeah. here for the first time, and he's already trying to Chelsea Brennan the answer. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Too late. Too late. <laughs> <I'll pick 1920. laughs> she did say 1920. Final answer. All right, we would love to tell you right now what the answer is, but of course, we got to make you wait for just a minute. Let's be serious for a minute, folks. What are the odds you're going to win that lottery and millions of dollars? You know the truth. But time and again, you lay your hard-earned money out for a ticket. Why put yourself through that? What if there were a better way? Well, here at Stacking Benjamins Industries, we don't think we know there's a better way. We present today a game sure to surprise and delight the inner you. We call it Throwing Your Money Away. Yeah, I was at the track the other night, and this fine little lady come up, and she said, 50-50 raffle? Well, I said, no thank you, ma'am, because I just got done and already threw $20 right in the trash. Nothing I like better than getting my paycheck and throwing most of it right away. Feels good. I was buying milk at the Quickie Mart yesterday, and they said the lottery was up to $123 billion. Ugh, all that hope and then so much regret later. I knew what I'd do. Well, I just stepped outside and threw $50 into the trash. It felt amazing. Yes, you too could join millions of Americans throwing money away every day. Then spend days and sometimes weeks hoping that lottery or raffle pays off. And I could buy a new bass boat, take the whole family to Six Flags, and maybe get a four-wheeler with Dale Earnhardt's logo on it. Why fill your days building list after list of items you'll never win when you can just throw your money away? And if you act now, we'll throw in a free no obligation lighter so you can upgrade your experience and just burn your cash. I whipped out my free no obligation lighter yesterday and torched $72 from my wallet. No lottery for me. Thanks SB Industries, that was fun and regret free throwing your money away available now wherever there's a trash can toilet or garbage disposal well dustin it's funny because i i said earlier to paula that i knew what month it was and even doug said it's today's date so of course it's march 6th duh, of uh <laughs> of that particular year but you said 1900 how confident you feeling now after everybody guessed behind you uh at least I'm, I didn't say like 1950, 1960, because that, that was my first thought. But I was like, no, it has to be much further back than that. Did we have that when Gwen was on? Didn't she say that what she say was was created in like 1969, like beer sold in a can? We're, <laughs> we're like, really, Gwen? That's that's how young Gwen is. Uh, 1879. OG, feeling pretty good with that, especially since Paula changed her mind. 
I guess we're going to find out. Yeah, Paula. I don't feel particularly confident. Paula, you got 1920. I'm second guessing myself. Yeah, yeah, which means realistically I have everything from 1910 on through modern day. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just stuck right in the middle there. So I, <laughs> from now on, I'm never going to pick first. That's like the <laughs> dumbest spot to pick. So I'm just, I, I have a tiny window. <laughs> Dustin's already making notes for next time. Yes. He's all set. All right, Doug, what's our answer? Welcome back, trivia nerds. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and let me recap for you. There was this little German company named Bayer, and they trademarked the word aspirin way back in the past. Well, my question was this. In what year did Bayer trademark aspirin? If you said 1920, well, not quite. It was earlier than that. But if you said March 6th, 1899, you'd be on the money. I wonder how much money that trademark made Bayer over the years. I don't even know that they had medicines back in the 1800s. I thought it was all like leeches and potions and uh, like spells. Well, now there I learned something. See, let's get you back to Joe and all these other yahoos talking around that rickety card table. See ya. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> that was uh, surprisingly uh, really close. Shot in the dark. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And Dave, I, and I, I, had I the, want half the profits, Len. Yeah, you got to write Len an email now and tell him that you get half of his big prize yes. this year. I was amazed because I had looked ahead to see what Doug's answer was. And when you said 1900, I was wholly right on it. And then I thought maybe, oh, gee, when he said 1890, I thought you were going to Chelsea Brennan him and go 1899. I was real close to just saying 1899. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> but, uh, but then Paula would have taken 1898. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> and, I actually and thought the answer was 1897. I said 79, but I would have dyslexia there for a second. I was going to say 97, but I still would have lost. So oh there well. it was. Impala, 1920. Better luck next time, huh? Yeah, seriously. Okay. I, you know, since the new year began and I, we stopped doing closest without going over, I discarded the Chelsea Brennan strategy, but clearly that is not working in my favor. So from this point forward, Paula is a new Chelsea again. We're two months into the new year and I can feel it coming back. I it's, can... Yeah, it's coming back with a vengeance. I had a soft, soft first 60 days and now the rest period is is over. I'm ready for the sprint. Are you saying no more Miss Nice Guy, Paula? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take Not a... <laughs> here on the Assembling Hamilton show. <laughs> yes, the kindler, gentler Paula while she's here. Let's take out the magnifying glass, guys, and help somebody do better with their money. Today's hotline call comes to us courtesy of magnifymoney.com. You know what happens, Dustin, when you head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money? I'm sorry. Am I supposed to know something here? <laughs> completely drawn a blank. That is perfect. No that is perfect. Well, this is what happens, Dustin. You find out those financial products you use every day at your brick and mortar bank, that they're nowhere near best in class because at Magnify Money, they rate over 92% of the products available online against each other. And you can see that the stuff you're using, you could be using way better online tools. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money, whether it's checking accounts, savings accounts, CDs, better credit cards, better student loan options, whatever it is, magnify money has it and use our link to get there. Stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money. Now, normally here we play a call. However, we asked a question that I wanted to draw everybody's attention to, and I wanted to get your take and share some of the takes. So on my Twitter feed at average Joe money, I asked this question. What's your best advice for future college students to fund their education when their parents can't or won't help them? I asked that question. So, OG, let's start with you this time. Your best advice for a future college student to fund their education when their parents can't or won't help them financially? Well, I think there's two that come to mind. First, pick a really cheap school to go to, especially initially, like a uh, community college. We talked earlier about making money and there's nothing wrong with taking five years to be done with school or six years to be done with school. Get a job or two, go to night school and get the first 60 or so credits out of the way at the lowest cost possible. It serves a couple of purposes. Firstly, it's inexpensive. And secondly, you don't know what the hell you're going to do when you're 18. And until you start getting into into school and start doing some classes and coursework, you may think I'll be the world's greatest accountant until you 
until you go to do accounting and realize you hate accounting. So you want to learn that on the cheap, not on the most expensive. So mine is low cost community college for the first little bit. It's funny. Our friend David Carlson at Young Adult Money agrees with you on Twitter. He said that this is a rare opportunity because most high schoolers don't think about the cost of a college degree. In this case, it's tough to argue against community college first two years. He also says, though, it partially depends on what they want to get out of college. It's easy for us to say community college from our seats, but in reality, some will want to be at the same university for four years. But, oh, gee, it's still a cost benefit analysis you got to do. Well, I didn't. The question was, what's the way to do it if no one's going to help you? Yeah. The way to do it if nobody's going to help you is do it inexpensively. Uh, uh, Dustin, what do you think? So I'm definitely one that I just hate how much college costs. So, oh, gee, I'm right there with you. I think that's a brilliant idea. But here's my advice. Don't go to college. That's my big advice. And the reason why is there's so many ways to make money instead of going to college and getting in that much debt. Now, I'm not saying that college is bad. I'm saying how much debt you're going to get. And there's so many ways to make money. So for everybody or for everybody on the show that's watching this right now with Joe and OG and Paul. So this is my diploma. I actually got it in wood like it's embossed. But I'm realizing I, I had this in a shelf and I was like, why do I even have this? Like, I'm successfully unemployed. I'm never going to work at another job again. I'm going to blow it up. I'm literally going to catch it on fire. I'm going to do a video where I'm actually going to have fun doing that. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to first get my kids BB guns. I'm going to shoot at it. Then I'm going to get my bow and arrow. Then I'm going to get a gun. Eventually, I'm going to blow it up and catch it on fire. The reason why is because I spent a lot of money on it and I will never use it again. So there are so many ways to make money. So everybody listening, this is an advanced strategy. But don't go to college, you're going to waste money. But you don't think that you use the skills that you learned in college or that maturation process of being there for a few years was helpful? I would say I learned two things. Number one, how to cheat. And number two, how to cut my own hair. So those are the two things that I learned. That's no, I, in all honesty, I probably did. I know what it because I went and got business degree. So I know I'm applying some of that stuff. But at the same time, Every business mistake that I've done running my own business, I've learned so much more than ever going to college. But yes, you're right. I have learned some. But remember what I said was it's how much it's going to cost that's going to be so ridiculously stupid. That's I just say don't do it because it's going to cost so much money. Instead of giving a fifty, sixty thousand loan to get a piece of paper to hopefully get a job, use that money, buy a rental property, make three hundred fifty dollars a month, two hundred fifty to three hundred fifty dollars a month in passive income, save your money, buy another one, do it all over again. That's what I'm teaching my kids. Yeah. Our friend uh, Jay Fleischman, student loan lawyer on uh, Twitter, likes the same stuff that you're talking about, Dustin. He says, don't go to college unless and until you know why, in all capitals, you're going to college. If you're just going because everybody else is going, which is why a lot of us went, then don't go. Paula, no parents helping you with college. What do you do? First, while you're still in high school, take as many AP classes as possible and take as many AP tests as possible because here's the beautiful thing. You do not have to take an AP class in order to take the AP test. And if you take the AP test, if you take the exam and you score a three or a four, it, the scoring is between one through five. So if you score a three or higher, like a three, four or five, then most colleges or many colleges will grant you college credit for that subject. So you can buy the textbooks, read them on your own while you're in high school, take the AP exam. Even if your high school doesn't offer the class, take the AP exam and test out of a ton of classes. You can basically test out of your whole freshman year. And then after you're finished with high school, you can, at any age of your life, continue to do the same thing, not with the AP exams, but with a different company called CLEP, which stands for College Level Examination Preparation or something like that, CLEP. CLEP exams you can take at any time, at any age. You don't have to take the course and you can test out of uh, or receive credit for college courses again. So if you are self-motivated and a self-starter and you're willing to just buy the textbooks, read them on your own and take the exams, you can test out of the first two years and then only pay for your junior and senior year. Similarly, uh, Saving Sherpa said, Air Force ROTC, not part of your answer, but the rest of it is. By the way, there were a few people that answered uh, different ROTC programs or using the GI Bill. But he says, lots of attempts on SAT, ACT, roam the web for scholarships. But the pioneers answered that and said, agree on studying and lots of attempts at ACT, SAT. That got me full tuition for my first year and half tuition for every subsequent year. I studied like crazy and took it four times. 
Never could get above the threshold needed for the full tuition for all four years, though. But just ACT, SAT prep, I mean, on top of the stuff that you're talking about, Paula, created a lot of money for fine years. Oh, yeah, yeah. Big money because with both SAT and ACT, they take your highest composite score. Basically, you don't get penalized for taking those tests multiple times. Good time to think about that right now for people in high school. Maybe have them have their high schooler listen to the show. A, they'll find out how brilliant Dustin is at bear related trivia. And then they'll also maybe get some ideas for for college. All right, guys, that's going to do it for today. By the way, if you've got a question, usually we take a question in that segment. So if you've got a question, head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash voicemail, and uh, we'll be happy to weigh in on whatever your question is for us. We're going to let our guest of honor go last. So, OG, what do you got going on this weekend? It is spring break. Starts right now. You're matter. you're doing the dad. So doing the yabba dabba do. No no no. I'm on vacation, man. Oh. It's spring break. Is that what you do on va- in spring break? By vacation, I mean my wife is taking my middle kid skiing for four days. Really? And I am not doing that. So. Which means you've got youngest and eldest that you're hanging out with. That'll be fun. But Alex really wants to earn money, so we'll just make him. We'll make him uh, babysit for the next four days, which I, I've started paying my kids in dad bucks, which is so comical to see them because I'm like, hey, thanks for watching the kids. You know, I'm just paying, you know, like a normal babysitter. Right. So if Alex watches them, and I just take a piece, he's like, hey, so it'll be like 10 bucks. I was, you're gone for an hour. I'm like, hold on. And I take a piece of paper, and like rip it off. And like and I just write like the 10 in the corner and like a little stick man in the middle and I'm like dad bucks and he's like that's not real money I'm like it's just like real money it's like a credit card it's backed by the faith and credit of your father I, exactly <laughs> full faith and credit so Mrs. OG and, and uh, William are going they're going to go skiing for a couple of days it's a uh, William's 10 year trip so they're going to do that and then um, uh, we're just going to hang out so I have no plans Copious amounts of movie watching, I think. Oh, that sounds like fun. That's always fun. Paula, what's going on at the Afford Anything podcast? On this same day that this episode comes out on the Afford Anything podcast, a certain guy by the initials of JSS. Who? uh, Who hosts a podcast called Piling Washingtons. That guy joins me on the Afford Anything podcast so that we can answer questions that come from the community. So if you... Well, speaking missed of missed the answering of questions and want to hear some Joe Saul see hi, come on over to the afford anything show. <laughs> there it is. You're like, didn't get my question here. Get all your questions on over there. And you and I have a ton of fun doing that. And every oh once in a while, we have a knockdown drag out argument where you are wrong. Joseph Andrew. Oh, but easy on that. I should have, <laughs> I should have never told you my middle name, Dustin. I, I told Paula my middle name and now she uses it like mom and it drives me crazy. <laughs> It's not as bad as mine. I'm half Japanese. I'm saying mine's bad, but mine's Yoshio. And so Yoshio, it's it, it's it's a little bit more rough to hear when somebody says Yoshio. I'm like, is that me? <laughs> but does your mom go Dustin Yoshio? No, she doesn't. My actual name is Dustin, but growing up, it was always Dusty. And when I got in trouble, it was Dustin. Dustin, get oh, over yeah, here. Yeah. So, yeah. so this whole experience, this whole podcast has been like your mom is mad at you, as we say <laughs> Dustin. I've kind of grown out of that, but it's been a long time. I mean, it's been uh, after slow, gradual cuts here and there. Eventually, I worked out to where Dustin's just fine. Well, tell us what's going on at Successfully Unemployed. You know, as you mentioned, there's only one other person who listens to the show, so you can share all the secrets about what's coming up soon. Yeah, so I have every type of way to quit your job, basically to be successfully unemployed. And so right now, I believe it's coming out where I'm interviewing somebody who was working as a physical therapist, no, sorry, a physical trainer at a CrossFit gym. And then it was going to close down. So his job was a trainer at this CrossFit gym. It's going to close down. The guy says, I'm going to close it up. And the guy that's a physical trainer says, I'll buy it. 
And he's like, okay. Well, so anyways, worked it out to where he bought it. He's been running it for like five, no, maybe like eight years now, doing fantastic. He loves what he does. And so just somebody that's just training, buys a business, has a business now. And so we, I interview so many people just like, I'm literally sitting in his gym, interviewing him in front of the camera. And yeah, it's fantastic. So I just try to find as many people who have another way rather than working for somebody else in that just overbroke job. And that is how I'm, I just, Love talking to more people about business. That is so awesome. I can't wait to listen to that. Accidental entrepreneur and probably way happier now that he did it too. Oh, he is so happy. He has his own people that he is around all the time. He he literally turns down people. People want to work out at his gym. He's like, no, I don't like his personality is really fun. Joe, you would absolutely love him. Um, he goes, no, I don't like you. You're not going to work out here. And he gets them <laughs> out. It's great. Get out of he here. Uh, and we'll link to successfully unemployed Dustin's podcast. We'll link to afford anything. We won't link to OG, uh, nickel and diamond his kids. We won't link to that, but everything else will be at our show notes page at stackybenjamins.com. All right, Doug, you got it from here, my friend. What should we have learned today? So what should we have learned today? First, we learned that maybe just shrinking your expenses isn't the magic formula for getting ahead in life. You just might have to earn more if you want to find bigger and better success. Second, retirement? Maybe you need more than just some rules of thumb. Tools like Jason Parker's calculator will help you figure out ways for your retirement nest egg to last a long time. But the big lesson? Remember to brush your teeth daily to make it an easy time at the dentist. Turns out that getting lots of dentist chair time now equals big bill in the mail time later. Special thanks to Dustin Heiner for coming to the basement to discuss what the biggest lie is and how to quit our jobs. You'll find Dustin on his YouTube channel, Successfully Unemployed, or on our show notes page. Also, thanks to Jason Parker for joining us in our fintech segment to talk about his retirement calculator. Interested in checking it out? We have an affiliated link. You can help the show and help your retirement if you use it. Stackingbenjamins.com slash calculator. Paula Pant appears courtesy of AffordAnything.com and Afford Anything podcast. All the Afford Anythings. This show is created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Karen Rapine, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and it appears I've fallen and I can't get up. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remunerations. That's a big word. There's no way you take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. And before making any financial decisions, consult with a real financial advisor. Welcome to the after show. This is the part of the show that doesn't exist. What happens on the after show stays here. If you have to talk about it, you can talk about dessert, but no, no discussion of this segment outside of that. Guys, you know, this piece that Miranda read for us of Nick's was called The Biggest Lie in Personal Finance. And it made me think about lies and about lying. And I was wondering if there's any lie in your life that stuck out, either a lie that you told or a story about a lie that you liked, or maybe somebody lied to you and you were, you were onto them. Anyone got one of those, Paula? Well, I have 
one. So this was seven or eight years ago. I was touring a potential rental property that I was thinking about buying. It's a triplex and uh, one that I didn't ultimately did not end up making an offer on. Um, but I was looking at it and I was with a real estate agent. And when we walked out, I knew that the water and sewer was, they were not separately metered for each of the units. You know, the, there was just one water and sewer line for the whole house. And typically in that area, you know, landlords pay for that. So as we walked out, I turned to the agent and I said, hey, do you know how much the monthly water bill is? And if she had just said, oh, I don't have that information offhand, but I'll get back to you, that would have been fine. You know, that 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 would have been the appropriate answer. But instead, what she said was, well, I don't know, but if it's high, you can just raise the rent. <sighs> <laughs> Red flags. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> And like, she's not wrong. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's not really a lie. It, it was deceitful. It was deceitful. Yes. It was deceitful. Yes. You know, and I was, if this was eight years ago, I was 28 years old, you know, um, like young, naive kid. I didn't know much at that age, but I knew just enough Don't know to know that she much. was full of BS. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but I know you're full of crap. Exactly. <laughs> Peter Cetera in the background. <laughs> that right, so... may be all I need to know. Oh, boy. So, like, just imagine that scene. Imagine being a real estate agent with, like, this 28-year-old girl who's living with roommates, like, scraping together her freelance writing money to try to put a down payment on, like, a broken-down fixer-upper triplex, and you're feeding her that, that kind of spoonful of crap? Like, please. Please. Well, we might as well turn this into a things that have not blown up in your face when you own a rental property after show. I, I got to believe, Dustin, you've got something. So since Paula kind of tore the Band-Aid off here on that one, I will add my two cents to this. I had a uh, currently own a triplex that we're remodeling and has been under remodel for eight months, which is just obnoxiously insane. It, it's a really old building, so it's got all knob and tube electrical in it. And so I said, hey, while the tenants are out, there's there's two of the three tenants are out. I said, why don't we rip all the walls off? Let's re-insulate it. We'll rewire it. You know, my threshold is I want a place nice enough that I would live there also. I'm not interested in being a slumlord. You know what I mean? And this place had seen better days. So we tear the walls off. One construction crew guts it all. And they the guy calls me, the property manager calls me, says, well, we can do the electrical one of two ways. He says, uh, you know, I got a buddy of mine that knows how to do electrical work. It's going to be 1500 If you want to pull permits and, you know, do it right. Government. Yeah. But he's like, he's totally like, if you want to go that route and do it the legal way, <laughs> that's going to be 7000 And I said, well, as uh, it's not your liability, if the place burns down because of faulty electrical work, we're going to do it the right way. And I know it's way more. So that's okay. So I go up there. He says, all right, all the electrical is done. I go up there and I walk around. I kind of show up randomly from time to time at property because, you know, th then they can't prepare for you. You know what I mean? You, you just show up and go, hey, I'm here. Give me the keys to this building. I want to walk in it real quick. And you can just see whether or not they're like, oh, yeah, sure. Or if they're like, uh, yeah, I think Bill's got him. He's over there right now doing stuff, you know. So anyway, I go in the building, walk around. I'm like, well, this isn't right. And that switch isn't done. And I can tell, you know, it's all gutted. So you can see where the electric work's done. So it's not done. So I said, well, it has to get done. Guy's like, well, we'll get it done. So then he sends a bill, an invoice for half of the amount due. And I said, uh, yeah, sure, absolutely. I appreciate it. You got it all done? He goes, yep, it's all done. I said, okay, great. Um, just for my records, just send me a copy of the uh, permit real fast in the in city inspection. I just want to put it in the file, you know, so when I go to sell it, I can go, look, I did this. Uh, yeah, you know, I think uh, Tim's got that at his desk or something. Let me check. Well, obviously, you know where this is headed. Yeah. No mm. permit. I said, listen, we're not, I'm not paying you a dime until it gets permitted. So the guy look just plain as day says, well, I talked to the electrician. The inspection happens after you do the drywall. <laughs> <laughs> and I just said, I said, I won't say his name, but I said, you know, I said, Bill, I know you think that I'm just some dumb a-hole from Texas, but you and I both know that that's not right. 
And if you don't know that that's not right, we got other problems. Oh, <laughs> let me talk to Tim. Well, magically they got a permit. So anyways, inspected it after it's all done and you can't look at it after it's all buttoned up. It's amazing. Then we have the inspector come in. It's amazing you know. how that works. 